Let's open with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. Father, we thank you for the nourishment for our spirit man on the inside of it, Father. And we thank you that you um, watch over us and guide us and help us in Jesus' name. And I just pray that you'll continue to be with us through this service and open my mouth. Let me be the um, instrument for you to speak to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me in, the, in your Bibles, if you would. We are in the book of Luke, chapter 13. Luke, chapter 13. Y'all can hear me okay? Yeah, I get it. It's nice to have a fan, but it's a little bit too much sometimes. Air conditioning seems to be working, but it's not quite ahead of the game. So we're in Luke, chapter 13. Everybody has it. Shout amen. All right, we got it. It's a couple of you anyways. I'm going to start in verse 11 just because I was reading this and I kind of like this passage. It's not my main message, but I am very able to digress if I want to. It's awesome. So Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 11. The Bible says, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years and was bowed together and it couldn't no wise lift up herself and when Jesus saw her he called her to him and said unto her woman thou art loosed from thine infirmity and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God amen I was in a program one time and a lady was she was bent over like this, and she had a little stick, and she, everywhere she went, she was doing like this. She was bent over with a spirit of infirmity, and God just healed her and straightened her up, and she had a little stick, and I'm so sorry I didn't get the stick. She'd been uh, traveling with the darn thing her whole life, and you know how when you hold something, it gets all smooth and polished, and the end was wore down from where she was using it, and she left the church, and she forgot the stick. And I was going to grab it for a souvenir, but before I knew it, it was gone. So um, thank God for the power of God. Jesus loosed her. He just laid his hands on her and told her she was loose, and she stood right up. And it's beautiful. Verse 14, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. So these guys, by their uh, pride, they just wanted to teach Jesus how you're supposed to really do this stuff. Because it's not right for people to get healed on the Sabbath. It's not okay for God to work miracles on the Sabbath according to the religious system. Because you got Monday through Saturday, man, or, or it would actually be Sunday through Saturday through Friday, man. You can come anytime and get healed, right? So these guys had their rules, and they were so upset that Jesus was coming to the temple on the Sabbath and healing people because he's working. And they're trying to bust him any way they can. They're trying to tear him down, trying to tear down him and his ministry, and um, trying to keep people from coming to him because he was a very serious threat. So these guys got mad and say, hey, you can't be healing people on the Sabbath. It's, it's, a, it's an offense. And the Lord then answered him and said, and Jesus is just like this uh, graduate of Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people, and you know, just to how to say and how to talk to people and schmooze them into uh, agreement with you so you can get maximum benefit out of people. Am I right? If you amen that, you're in trouble. He says, thou hypocrite, there's an opening line, at least we know where, you, where you're at, thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Don't you guys take care of your animals on the Sabbath? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, Lo, these 18 years be loosed from bond on the Sabbath day. Look, y'all are watering your animals. You're making sure they got something to eat. You're not making your animals suffer on the Sabbath. 
What about this lady? She's a child of Abraham. Can't she be healed? You know, y'all, you're, you're inconsistent. You're all over the place. Verse 17, and when he had said those things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and the people rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. So the people saw through the charade of the religious leaders, as I think today we're seeing a lot of charades being played by the religious leaders, but the people, the actual ones that Jesus cared about the most, they saw, they saw through the religious leaders, and they saw they finally had a shepherd, and they were happy. Hey, thank God, we got a Savior. Then said he, verse 18, Unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it? What's the kingdom of God like? What's it going to look like when it gets here? He said, It's a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. Amen? So, y'all have seen poppy seed bagels? A grain of mustard seed is about as small as a poppy seed. They're really tiny seeds. But yet, out of that little tiny seed, something really great will grow. Amen? Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Amen? He's saying, look, you can take something little, like a grain, and stick it in the ground and it'll grow and it'll produce and, and, and be glorious and luxurious and beautiful. And that's what he's saying the kingdom of God is like. It will continue to grow. It will continue to flourish in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, he said, verse 20, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid these three measures of meal and until the whole was leaven. Now what leaven is, is um, yeast. And what it does, it, it, it eats, or yeah, it eats um, dough. If you take wheat and you grind it up into flour, you add water, and you mix it up and you got dough, it'll just sit there. But you put a little bit of leaven in it, that thing will take over, man. It'll be like a blob. It'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, I had a bakery, and every now and then we'd get some dough that for whatever reason we couldn't use it or we had to throw it away, and you put it in one of those real big trash cans, and before the end of the night, the darn thing's popping out of the top of the trash can. It just keep getting bigger and bigger. It was a mess. That's what he's saying is the kingdom of heaven is full of growth, and it will continue to expand and grow and expand and, and grow. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in the kingdom. We should be growing individually as persons, and on top of that, numerically, this church shall continue to grow in Jesus' name. Our, our strength is not in the numbers. Our strength is in the, um, is in the power of God. It's in the fact that we're in the kingdom. Amen? Are you, are you, Mary, are you recording this? Are you, are, yeah, turn the phone the other way. Because it, it, okay, okay, it's all right. And again, he said, whereunto shall I like it? Oh, I read that already. Let's go to verse 22. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And then the verse continues, and he said unto them, and he, and he continues, but I'm going to hit this for a second. You got this one guy that comes into Jesus, and his question is, Lord, are there just a few people that are going to be saved? And, it, and it's a legit question. You, you should consider how many people are going to be saved, but a more legitimate question than this would be, what must I do to be saved? And that was the question that the uh, centurion asked in the book of Acts. I think it was chapter 6, no, check, Acts chapter 9, no, Acts chapter 6. No, I wrote it down for the cry. Oh, yeah, Acts 16 and verse 30, the centurion asked um, Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
That's a very, very much more important question than how many people are even going to be saved in the first place. You understand? So I want to talk about this few concept for just a couple minutes. If you'll turn with me, if you will, in your scriptures to 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 21, I believe it is, 18. Let's turn all the way, yeah, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the Bible says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Amen? Jesus suffered for us. He actually put up with a whole lot. Because this entire world is in complete disobedience to God. And at that time, it was 400 years of silence. And God had just basically left the world to be on its own. He didn't send any word. He didn't send any prophets. Heaven was just like, nope, 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 for, for 400 years. And finally, Jesus shows up on the scene, and he starts preaching the word of God. And now the water of life started to flow on the earth again and Jesus really suffered um, putting up with all those people because he was with God in the beginning he was with God he's watching all this stuff that people are doing and God doesn't like it and then on top of that he went to the cross and suffered and bled and died and he had to do it so that we can be reconciled to God somebody better shout amen, amen. the just for the unjust you see on the cross there's an exchange what he does is he takes the punishment that we deserve and he dies for us because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Um, Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We don't deserve to live. We deserve to die. Jesus, being righteous and never sinned, did not um, deserve to die, but he willingly went to the cross and suffered and bled and died so that the death could, his death could pay for our sins, and he paid the price for us. Amen? The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God so that we can be reconciled to God so that the, the debt that we owed for our sin that we could never pay, no matter how hard you worked, you could never be righteous, you could never do enough good deeds to be okay with God. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness because of Abraham's faith he was justified by faith saved by a great faith that not of yourselves it's the gift of God we are reconciled to God by the life of Jesus Christ that he shed his blood the life of the flesh is in the blood he shed his life on the cross and died for us that we can be reconciled to him that he might bring us to God and being put to death in the flesh for it's impossible for God to die. Jesus never died. His body died on the cross. But quickened by the Spirit. We know that he died. We know that he was buried. We know that he was in the grave for three days. And on the third day he rose again. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Because he did not deserve to die. It was injustice that we meted, met, meted out upon him. While he was on this earth, we did it. We're the guilty party. And God saw that he was put to death unjustly and resurrected him from the dead to never die again. Amen? And by that spirit that raised him from the dead, verse 19, by which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Amen? Talking about the... the the, he went into the spirit realm and preached to those people who had not yet been redeemed and they won't be redeemed if, it's, if the spirits that he's talking about are the saints of old, which some commentators believe that that was those guys that died, that they won't be fully redeemed until Jesus comes and we're all raised again and we're taken out of the prison and we're no longer held. But... Um, other people think he was preaching, he went to hell and he preached to the devil, but I, I don't believe that completely because 
what, all you're going to do is just say, hey, look what I did. You know, you, you're not going to make any difference in those people's lives. So that's what I think he's talking about, the people that are trapped in between death and their resurrection on the last day, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So I'm, I'm not going to get into all that. I don't want to, I don't want to dig that deep into this. But we know that in the days of Noah, God waited because he gave Noah an assignment. And he said, look, I want you to build an ark and it's so many cubits by so many cubits. And he gave him the dimensions of it. And Noah spent about 120 years building this ark every day by hand. And he was like the crazy guy in the neighborhood that just started to build some gigantic boat. And he didn't even do it by the water. He just did it by his house, you know, and. People are, and he's like, yeah, I'm building the boat. And they're like, well, how are you going to get it to the water, Noah? I mean, the thing is hum hum humongous. How are you, what's your plan now? you got a giant boat in your yard. You'll never, it's so big, you'll never move it. And um, it was all part of God's plan because God knew what he was doing, and Noah knew what God was doing. And Noah showed his faith that he believed in God and trusted in God by the act of building this gigantic boat. And so while he's building it, God's like, okay, come on, Noah, let's go, let's go. And he's waited like 120 years for him to get this boat done. God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was up repairing, wherein few, because we remember that other verse we read, how, how are, are a lot of people going to be saved or just a few? And that was that guy's question. Is it going to be everybody? Is it going to be a whole lot of people? Is it going to be just one or two people? What's it going to be like? And the Bible says, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Amen? The Bible, when he says few, he means few. Amen? Y'all remember, and I, I, and I love when I was in the synagogue with the Messianic Jews, and he doesn't say, remember when the Jews were in the um, land of Egypt. He doesn't say it that way. He says, remember when we were in the land of Egypt? And in a sense, we were, we were in the land of Egypt because Egypt is a type or symbol of the world system. When we were walking with the sons of disobedience in the world system, God called us out of Egypt and placed our feet on level ground and added us to his kingdom on this earth in Jesus' name, amen. What he's talking about is the Egyptians in those days, um, actually the Jews when they were in Egypt in those days, the whole entire nation under pressure, God did 10 different miracles, and the last one was the death of the firstborn, and the Egyptians were like, okay, 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 we can handle the darkness, we can handle the fog, we can handle the gnats, we can handle all this other stuff, but now that you've killed the firstborn, we're done with you guys. And they said, go. And all the Jews left Egypt, and they went, in, went toward, into the wilderness towards the promised land. Now, that's about a nine or ten day journey by foot. It's a pretty long walk. But because these children of Israel were out of Egypt, but they still had Egypt on their insides, they were, they were disobedient. And they were grumbling towards God, and they were complaining, and they were saying, uh, what, did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? And they spoke these things, and then God allowed them to come to pass, and the bodies of every single person that came out of the land of Egypt, they all died in the wilderness, except for two guys, Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses, the lawgiver, the man of God that God chose to bring his children into the promised land died in the wilderness because of his disobedience. Amen? When the Bible says few, it means few. Amen? So now, I don't know the eternal condition of those people, but if you want to extrapolate it out, it doesn't take a whole lot to say that those guys were disobedient in the wilderness and therefore they were cut off. 
because they were definitely cut off from this life. I don't know whether God is going to allow them into his eternal kingdom or not in the heavens. I don't know. That's up to God. But we are to live on this earth as though we miss this thing. We miss it for good. Amen? The, now, I get it. The, the mercy of God endures forever, and he's good, and he's merciful, and he loves us, and he cares about us. But mercy is not a license. In other words, there was a teaching among the Nicolaitans that said... Um, God gets glory by the fact that he forgave our sins. Therefore, the more we sin, the more mercy he has, and the more he can demonstrate his glory. Therefore, the more we sin, the more glory that we give to God, and therefore we can sin all we want to, it doesn't matter anymore. Amen? But that's not what the Bible says. That's just a crazy worldly system that people use to justify their bad behavior so where are we at you know when the bible says few he means few and we are to live our lives as though few means like one or two people out of millions we are to live like joshua and caleb were to give every effort and do everything we can possibly do to act right and to do right and to be right. Amen? Because that's what God wants ultimately anyways. I believe that there's more grace than that. But sometimes you start blurring the lines a little bit, and it's, it's difficult. So the, the Bible standard is, the Bible says, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And God expects perfection out of us. He wants us to be perfect. He wants us to never sin. He wants us to walk in the light as he is in the light. He wants us to really live the way he wants us to live. Amen? And what we want to do is we want to deviate. We want to go to the lowest common denominator. We want to do the, how, how much sin can I do and still make heaven? You know, if I get a D minus, is that still passing? You know, can I walk through life and have a D minus average in my Christian walk and still be okay. That's not the point. The point is we need to be A+. Plus. We need to do the best possible job we can do and not be all over the place. Amen? So I'm back in Luke now, chapter 13. And this is what I was reading. The guy's like, are there a few that can be saved? Well, at least a few. God forbid... It's only a handful of people out of all the people that believe in Jesus all around the world. But I know that there are some people that say they believe in Jesus, but you look at their life and you know that they're just either deceiving themselves or they're highly deceived or they're, maybe they're just idiots. I don't know. They come to church and they shout hallelujah on Sunday and Monday through Saturday they're living like wild animals. I'm not going to encourage that. And Jesus is in either we're going to go into verse 24. The Bible says, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Amen? That sounds pretty restrictive. He says, Many will seek to enter and shall not be able. Well, what kind of people seek to enter the, the kingdom of heaven? What sort of, what sort of people seek to be saved? Is it the pagans? Is it the unbelievers? The Muslims? The Buddhists? The Confucius? Are those people seeking God? No. Who's, who's preaching or who's seeking God? Who wants to be saved? It's us, right? It's the so-called church Christian people. We want to be saved. So he's talking to us. He says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in. Many will seek. Many, many people are going to be seeking God. Many people are going to seek to enter the straight gate. They know about it. 
They're putting about a little bit of effort, and they're doing what they can to an extent to be saved. Am I right? If I'm looking at this verse, I'm like, strive to enter in at the straight gate. So these people are striving. You got to give them credit. They're striving. But what about the people that are seeking? Aren't they striving too? Aren't they coming to church and singing and shouting and shouting hallelujah and praising God? They're seeking. They're doing something. They're better than the pagans and the unbelievers. And I'm like, what's the difference? What's the difference? What's going on? How come you can have people that are seeking and shall not be able? How are they going to miss this? And I looked up the word strive in the Greek to try to get an idea what that means. I'm going to spell it with the English spelling. It's A-G-O-N-I-Z-S-T-H-E. Sounds a whole lot like agonize to me. Agonize. That makes a lot more sense. Strive is you can strive, but strive doesn't speak of the agony that you go through. You know, like you're in a marathon and you've been running for 20 miles and you got shin splints and every muscle in your body is wore out and you're about ready to fall over because you're so tired and you're, maybe your feet are cut and you got blisters and you're like, man, I want to quit, I want to quit, I want to quit. And you're going through this pain and you're going through this agony. You're, you're suffering like crazy to finish the race. And that's what it is. You got a bunch of people that are interested in cotton candy religion, where it's all nice and fluffy and sweet and easy. And you start preaching about agony and pain and difficulty and struggle and nightmarish headaches that you got to go through to serve God. And then they don't want to hear it anymore. Amen? Now, I know I can fill this church up. I know I can shift my preaching style, and I can shift my subject matter and start stroking people and telling them what good people they are, and you're doing great, and just keep doing what you're doing, and bring your tithes and your offerings and do all that, and this church will be slapped full. I know I can do that. But who am I helping? I'm sure not helping me. Because I'm going to be held accountable for everything I say from this altar. So I can't be deviating all over the place and tickling men's ears and telling them what they want to hear. And I'm not helping those guys because I'm lying to them. I'm, I'm telling them stories about what must I do to be saved. I'm, I'm watering down the gospel, you know, and it's just, it's no good anymore. It's all watery and who cares, right? People don't like it. I mean, they, they do on the surface. Oh, this is easy. I love that church. You know, it makes me feel good. You know, church is not designed to make you feel good. This word of God is not designed to make you feel good about yourself. If you're walking in sin, you're walking in darkness, it's not supposed to make you feel good because if you feel good, you are um, absolutely not getting out of it what you're supposed to get out of it and that's that you feel guilty and you're um you're you're impressed to change amen water on my bible can you imagine that didn't go as well as i planned <laughs> it'll be okay though be dry be dry the water of life spilled into the word of god so the uh you know the the word of god is designed to make you uncomfortable. And people don't like it. You know, they're like, well, 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 I don't like that pastor. He's so harsh. I don't like the message. It makes me feel guilty. Yes, it's supposed to make you feel guilty because you are guilty. We are guilty. What we need is something to remove the guilt from us, which is called the blood of Jesus. Amen? And if you don't see your need you don't see where you're at, you'll never change. You'll just keep continue going and going and going, and you're going to be like that 
and, and it won't help you. Amen? So I've got a job to do, which is to put this word of God out there, even though people don't really like it. Somebody shout amen. So that's why we are where we are. I'm going to say this word of God. I'm going to say it the way that needs to be said. I don't care if people like it or not. I'm not here for you. I'm here for God because he has a job that he wants me to do. He's given me the assignment of this city and this church and you guys. And I'm not going to hell for you. I'm not, I'm not going to deviate. I'm not going to tell stories just to make you happy because it doesn't work for me. Amen? Agonize to enter the straight gate. Suffer a little bit. You see, I'm, I'm pushing you. And I know I'm pushing people. I know I push them like crazy, and I don't care. Amen? I had a, I'm going to tell, tell on somebody. I had a lady come by the house this week, and she's a nice lady, and she believes in Jesus and, you know, all that. And she said, um, you know, I, I think I'd like to come to your church sometime. <laughs> I'm like, well... I don't need you to come to the church. Because what they want to do is they want you to be like Ned Flanders and a weak pastor. Oh, that's really nice. It's wonderful if you could come to the church. We really need people to come to the church. And they want me to be weak. And they want me to go into that mode of stroking. Oh, you're so nice. We'd sure love to have you. We need you people like you in the church. No, you stay home. Because you're not serious at all. And I said to her, when's the last time you've been in church? Well, you know, I work seven days a week. Well, there's another error. You don't, you don't honor the Sabbath? You've got to work on the Sabbath? That's a mess. You're a flat-out train wreck. And I, said, I said that. I said to her, we, we don't need you. What I need you to do, I need you to repent and turn from your wicked ways and get serious with God because we're in the last days and Jesus is coming for real. I need you to strive. I need you to put forth some effort. Act busy. Act serious. Act like you got something you need to do. Amen? you got to press in to the things of God for many people are going to seek to come into the kingdom of God and they're not going to be able to because they were not serious. They were playing with God all over the place. That's the difference. Some people are striving. Some people are playing. Amen? Verse 25, he changes it a little bit. and he's, He illuminates on this same thought. He says, when once the master of the house has risen up and it has shut the door and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Amen? Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 7. I'm in uh, verse 11. The Bible says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons, with them into the ark and they and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind every bird of every sort they went in unto noah into the ark two and two of all flesh wherein is the breath of life and they that went in went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him, 
and the Lord shut him in. Amen? Well, what happened to all the people? What happened to all of his friends, all of his neighbors, and everybody else that he'd been telling them that it's going to rain? What happened to those guys? The door shut. It can't be opened. God shut it. What God shuts, no man can open. What God opens, no man can shut. The door of the ark is shut. And then suddenly it starts to rain, right? And it rained a little bit today, and it can be like a little pitter patter rain, and a couple storms roll in here and there, and it rains. It didn't rain in those days. They said a mist from the earth came up and watered everything. I don't know how that went. I don't understand. But I do get it when you tell me it's starting to rain. And it rains. I was in Florida, and it rained, and it poured down flipping rain all day long. And it's like, wow. It's really raining. It rained and 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 rained. And then the next day, it did the same thing. It rained and rained and rained and rained and rained, poured down rain. By the third day, it poured down rain, and streets that were never flooded were this deep in water. Amen? So these people are standing there after three days of hard rain, and the water's maybe up to their between their knees and their ankles and they're walking all around and the streams are flowing and they're like man it's getting really rainy out you know now what well it's okay you know maybe it'll stop tomorrow you know then it's up to your flipping armpits it's a flood and like what do we do well let's go beat on the sides of the ark maybe Noah will let us in you see so they're pounding on the side and shouting, hey, let us in, hey, let them. It's shut. Door shut. You had your golden opportunity. You know, Noah was a um, spectacle to his entire generation. He, he built the biggest, craziest thing you could build. I built a gigantic ark, probably four or five times bigger than this whole church. Humongous, maybe bigger than that, I don't even know. Just built this big battleship sized ark and loaded all the animals in it. And people are still, ha ha, look at him. Can you believe it? Noah's still building that ark. Man, that's really funny. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been doing that for years. He says it's going to rain. And all these people are mocking him. Amen? Well, what about today? Are they mocking us? Where are the people at? You, you think it's going to start raining. Don't you think you ought to at least make a reservation of some kind? Maybe call ahead and say, hey, I'm definitely coming, hold my spot. My phone don't ring. People aren't calling and making reservations because we're in the last days. The Bible says in the last days, the love of most will grow cold. Amen? This ain't no joke. It's no, it's no play thing. You can't live with God any kind of way and have it be all right with you. Amen? Strive, agonize to enter the straight gate. Put out the effort. Pay the price. Do whatever you got to do. Because if you don't do it, who will? It's your responsibility, your personal responsibility to connect your faith with action and strive to enter by the straight gate. I'm warning you. I'm warning you people on the internet that are listening to me. Listen, this ain't no joke. It's not time to play. You can't live any kind of way out there. I know it's popular. People are having all kinds of crazy lifestyles, and they're all together in it, and they think we're in a democracy, and if enough people vote on it, then God has to do it our way. I got news for you. It's about ready to rain. If you can't see the rain clouds gathering on the sky, I feel bad for you because it's going to happen for sure. Strive to enter by the straight gate. Agonize. Amen? He said, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. almost a parallel passage it's a slightly different verbiage i think that jesus when he preached probably had pretty much the same message everywhere he went and um he said it different ways because it's kind of boring just to repeat yourself over and over with the um 
with these messages. This Matthew chapter 7 is the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus, it's a fam very famous, very beautiful sermon that Jesus gave and people were in awe of his capacity when he preached this stuff. But I'm going to pick up in chapter 7 and verse 13. It's almost the same verbiage, but I'm going to pull a few more things out of it. Jesus says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Amen? Most folks are on the highway to hell, they got the pedal to the metal, and they're going as fast as they can, and they're all doing it, and they all think they're going to get away with it, because everybody's doing it, and we're in a democracy, and we can vote on morality, and it doesn't matter what God says, live any kind of way you want, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Live any kind of way you want to. There's a, a world without consequences. And they're, you know, they're in their brand new GR1 Corvettes doing 200 miles an hour on the highway to hell. And they're, and they're just going fast as they can. They're on the Autobahn now. They're just going, going, going. And a few of us are standing by the side of the road going, hey, the, the bridge is out ahead. The bridge is out ahead, and they're like, ha ha, look at those guys, they don't even have cars, and they're mocking us. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. It's the psychology of the crowd. Everybody's doing it, so it must be okay, because straight is the gate and narrow the way. It's uncomfortable, which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Amen? I promise you, if you're sitting under the sound of my voice, you've found the way of life. Because I don't have an agenda. I didn't get to a PhD in theology to be able to figure this out. I don't have to be that smart. All I got to do is read what the Bible says, and that's what we're going to do in this church. I, I don't have another agenda. I don't have anything else to do. Amen? I am doing this not for my own, not because I wanted to do it professionally, not because I sought this as a job. It's because I wanted to serve God with all my heart because I read this book and I realized this world is in huge trouble. Amen? The reason they're in trouble, they're not following the Word of God. They're doing it their way. I'm going to do it God's way. If you want to be on board with that, come join us. If you want to do it some other way, go find another church. Beyond that, maybe you can find a bunch of people that are striving instead, instead of agonizing. Maybe you can find a preacher that will make you comfortable, and it, he'll pet you and tell you you're a good boy. And it doesn't matter. We're all sinners anyway. Amen? I'm not that guy. I'm not going to stand before God on the day of judgment. And, and imagine what it would be like, right? Now it's judgment day, right? And you got like 10,000 people that you've been lying to about what must I do to be saved. And you're all in the room together, and you're the guy that's been doing all the lying, and all the other people realize they're going to be cast into the lake of fire to burn forever with the devil and his angels. And I'm the guy that lied to you. Are you guys going to be happy? No. You're going to want to kill me. So it's going to be even worse. Amen? But on the other side of the coin, when we stand before the judge and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And I walk through those pearly gates and Jesus gives me a big hug and says, you did it, boy. Good job. Now I have entered into eternal life. And, and on top of that, I have brought all of you with me. How are you going to feel about me then? You're going to love me, right? It's the truth. We're talking about your salvation. We're talking about my salvation. We're talking about our families and our friends and our capacity to reach these guys. But it's agony. People are going to mock you. They're going to hate you. They're going to say all kinds of stuff falsely. They're going to persecute you. They're going to overlook you for promotions. They're going to do all kinds of rubbish to you that they should never do. Look at Daniel. He's the guy that's running the entire kingdom of Babylon. He is. And he's so pure in everything that he does, they can't find anything to accuse him of. But they want him out of power because they can't maneuver in the system and collect bribes and enrich themselves because he's in power. 
and he knows what they're up to, and he's, he's, he's uh, doing his job, and these guys, they want him out. They want him out so bad, they make up a set of rules special for Daniel to get him kicked out of the kingdom. Amen? You think you're more special than he is? You think if you're acting right, they're not going to persecute you and give you trouble? They will. You're going to agonize. You're going to go through trouble. Things aren't all rosy. We want to, we want to, we want to, we want a gospel that makes us feel good. Jesus died for your wallet. Amen. We want feel good religion. Well, I can't give it to you. I wish I could. I wish I could just give you like the Dale Carnegie self improvement class, and you become a really good person. You become really successful in life, and you do really well in life. And you don't have to worry about your eternity. Everything's cool. Amen? It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. I wish I could say that it does. Amen? But it doesn't. You can be real successful in life. You can go real far. These biblical principles are true. They're going to help you tremendously in life. You're going to go a lot farther, most of us, than we normally would without God. Amen? But I can't, I'm not here to paint a picture that all you got to do is come to Jesus and all your dreams are going to come true. Amen? God is, he delights in the prosperity of his servants. He wants us to do well. But that's not his primary focus. His primary focus, Jesus said, I have come to seek and save the lost. He said, I must be about my father's business. This church, we must be about our father's business. We must be about seeking and saving the lost. That means although the message is somewhat impalatable, it's not flavorful and nice, we still got to say it. Look, you need to change your evil ways. You can't continue to live like this all the time anymore. Amen? And I know they don't like it. I, I was reading some commentary when the, they overturned Roe versus Wade. And some people are really upset about it. And they're, they're mad at God, mad at the church. Well, y'all just want the right to terminate life. Amen? That life never ceases. Did you know that when an egg and a sperm come together, at the microscopic level, there is a little tiny beam of light that emanates from that cell? There's life in that thing from the word go. And it's not our place to determine what to do with that life. Amen? And if you don't have the moral fortitude to stand up and say, this is wrong, let's talk about euthanasia. When you've worked hard your whole life and you're no longer useful to the empire. And now you're just a drain on society's resources. Don't they have the right when you don't really have anything you can say about it, you're maybe in dementia and you're just on, a, on your deathbed and you're going to be there for a while, don't they have the right to just snuff you out because it's convenient? Because it's about sacrifice on the altar of convenience, isn't it? Well, I digress. Let's go to um, Matthew 7, 23. Let's go to 22. Nope, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. These people honors me with their, with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They know how to say, Lord, Lord, like a puppet. Lord, Lord, I love you, Jesus. Amen. I've met people, and they got, the, they got their church, man. They know all the buzzwords. They know what to say. They will say, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I love the Lord. And they'll, and they'll let you know that they're some kind of a special, close relationship with God. But where are they at? Shacking up, having kids out of wedlock, doing all kinds of crazy stuff in their lives, drugs and alcohol and everything else. But they want you to think that they're all right with God. They're just saying, Lord, Lord, I love you, Lord, like a little parrot. You can buy, you remember the easy button, one of those commercials? Boom, you press it, it goes, that was easy. It's just a little recorder, and you hit it, and it goes, That's, that was easy, that was easy. 
You can get the same thing. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. It's meaningless. There's nothing behind it. It's just yap. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord. Yea, Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord and not do what I say? Y'all want the easy way. You want God to just look the other way on your misbehavior that you want to have, you want to think, and you're deceiving yourselves. You think that you're having a relationship with God, and at the same time, God's got nothing to do with you. He's not in your mess at all. Amen? You're pretending. They're pretending. The world is pretending. I'm telling you, this is very, very, very dangerous for the people of God. You're in trouble. We're in trouble. Everybody out here in the world, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff in the churches these days. I'm not even going to talk about it because it's so disgusting it should not be discussed in public. But you already know from reading the news what it is I'm talking about. People pretending to be walking with God. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, but not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, he that strives, he that agonizes for a relationship with God, blessed are the, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It should be your primary focus to serve God and to love God. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Didn't we go to church? Didn't the prophet speak to me? Prophet liar. And in thy name cast out devils. Amen. You know that God's name is powerful, right? The seven sons of Sceva in the book of um, Acts chapter um, I think it's 13. Where is he? Yeah, Acts chapter 19, verse 17. The seven sons of Sceva were Jewish guys that were casting out devils in the name of Jesus. See, the, the devils are afraid of that name, and they don't care who says it. That name of Jesus has power in it. And you can be kind of a crazy, not following Jesus person, and you can put the name of Jesus out there, and sometimes them devils will leave. But that doesn't mean the people doing the casting out of the demons are always right with God. It means that God's name has power. <clears throat> and in thy name done many wonderful works. Amen. <coughs> Got hospitals. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Got hospitals, orphanages, spending millions and billions of dollars. Doing great works in the name of Jesus. And I'm not saying these are bad people in, in the, from a world standpoint, that these are evildoers in that sense. You know, it's like we want to compare ourselves to Adolf Hitler and say, well, I'm not e evil like Adolf Hitler. No, but you got evil in you, it's in our hearts. We're, we're fallen. We're broken. We're hurting. We need Jesus. We need his grace. We need his forgiveness. But we need to agonize for it. Amen? And in thy name, done many wonderful works. I mean, it's wonderful. Thank God for the hospitals and the care that people can get that couldn't get care otherwise. Thank you, Jesus, that that stuff's being done. But that does not mean that that person's right with God. Sometimes it's just a show. They want to show how big and how strong and how wonderful they are. Amen? They're not walking with God at all. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Amen? Whew, it's a mess. Let's go back to Luke chapter 13. Verse 26, then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence.
friends. Man, we were at the Pharisee's house with you. We went and had dinner together. Don't you remember me? And thou hast taught in our streets. Yeah, I, I came to the meetings. I was listening to what you were saying. I was trying to get my life together. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not. I don't even know who you are. You ain't nobody to me. God's no respecter of persons. We can't curry his favor by living any kind of way. And then he's going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you came to church that time. That's awesome. Come on in. It doesn't work that way. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not. And then it says, whence you are. I don't even know where you're from. I don't, I don't know you. We're not together in this. Amen? Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see. This is terrible. People are going to they're gonna cry. They're going to stand on judgment day, and they're going to know they ain't right with God. And all they can do is stand there and just cry and cry and cry like bitter crying like you've never seen that any normal rational people would be oh it's okay it's going to be okay. it ain't going to be okay you have decided with your entire life that you're not going to walk with God you're not going to serve God you're going to live any kind of way you want to and when it gets to the end and you see the fire and you are getting in a bus with a ticket with your name on it that leads to the fire, and you know you're going through that door, and once you go through that door, there's no way out. You're going to cry. The Bible says, and they're going to be gnashing of teeth. It's going to be like the people on the days of Noah. They're going to be standing. I mean, you can't, I don't have a wall to beat on. You know, they're going to stand there, and they're going to beat on the boat, and they'll be thumping on it. Give me a rock, and they'll be pounding on the boat. Hey, hey! And they'll be shouting, Noah, 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 remember me? I'm the guy that brought you in the wood that time. Let me on. No. No. You know, really, Noah could have actually paid some of those guys in that day to go, well, go get me some logs, I'll pay you. You understand? They could have actually done work on the ark and then got nothing out of it you realize that there are people that built this church that did work in this church and never got saved that you can come to church every single day and you can work here day and night and day and night and be a blessing to this house and you can miss eternity with jesus it ain't about what you did it's about your heart issue do you love God? Do you want to serve God? And these people are going to stand there and they're going to shout. And that's what the Bible talks about, gnashing of teeth. Not the grinding of teeth. He's just talking about yappy, yappy, yappy. Noah, 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 Noah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I was at the party with you. We went to that guy's house and we ate. I went to church. I, went and I did all kinds of stuff. It doesn't work. You ain't striving. You're not agonizing. You're just seeking. We're just seekers. The church has to be seeker-friendly. Have you heard that one? It's a seeker-friendly church. Oh, yeah, people are seeking God, and we're friendly towards them. No, I'm not interested in seekers. I'm looking for people that want to agonize. Let's agonize together. Let's get together and agonize for the things of God. Let's go through some struggles. Let's pay a price. This thing's valuable. Let's make sure we don't miss this thing for love or money. Amen? We can't miss this thing. We cannot. We must not. We must not. Not for anything. Not for anybody. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they say about us. I don't care about the talk that comes out of their mouths. I don't care what their viewpoint is. I don't care. There's nothing that's going to stand between me and standing before Jesus, hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. 
Because when you hear that word, you're going to be like, ha, I'm in. And once you're in, you can't leave. There's no way out. The devil's not there. Sin's not there. Darkness isn't there. Pain is not there. Suffering is not there. Sickness is not there. Nothing negative in life is there. Only the positives. Amen? Now, think about how nice this life would be here on this earth, in the flesh. If everybody loved each other, we all cared about each other, we're all trying to look out for the other guy and trying to be friendly and, you know, you, you need something done on your house and your neighbors are like, oh, I see you need, I was walking by your house and I see the eaves need to be painted and, man, neighbor, I'd love to paint those for you. And they just do it just because they're good neighbors and they love you. Amen? And sometimes it happens. But imagine if it was like that all the time, just people loving each other. You know, you're growing garden vegetables, and then you realize that your neighbors could use vegetables, and you just give them away. And then maybe the other neighbor has cows, and he just kills a cow, and, hey, you want some steak? And so we all just share everything. There's no uh, monetary um, system in place anymore where we're tracking who's making what. Amen? We're just doing it out of love. This, this life could be beautiful. Amen? But instead, people want to heap up more and more and more and more to themselves, and they want to become millionaire, billionaire, trillionaire, zillionaires at the expense of everybody else. Amen? The, uh, oh my God, Goodwill got $10 million from Jeff Bezos' ex-wife. $10 million. I mean, okay, great. I'm happy for you. You got 10 million, you know. That's great. Where in the world did he get 10 million dollars? She took half the money that she got when they got divorced and sold the stock and gave it away. Half of it. And just in South, I mean, it was billions. And in just South Bend, they, they, they gave away 10 million dollars just like it was nothing. Where'd that money come from? But he won't pay his workers. Where's that money come from? It comes from me and you. And he's hoarding it up for himself. Stacking up more cash. You, you don't need a $500 million lot, a yacht. What are you going to do with it? There's people starving in the world. There's people that are suffering. Why don't you do something nice with it? Amen? The other one that gets me is Christians. I've had a couple people do this. Well, my destiny is to be kingdom finance. And God's going to bless me with a business, and I'm going to make a lot of money, and I'm going to give the money to um, missions work and the spreading the gospel and stuff. Okay. What are you doing now? You doing it now? Why don't you do it now? Why don't you give now? While you got the capacity to do it, why don't you do it now with what you got? Show God you're serious. What they're really saying is, someday when God blesses me and then I got more money than I know what to do with, then I'm going to suddenly become generous. Well, if you can't be generous now, you can't be generous then. You're the same person. Amen? <sighs> that was heavy. Is that heavy enough for you? God is, what? It's, it's, it's very solid. People don't read the Bible. They want other people to come and tell them little sweet things. They don't realize some of this real heavy stuff is in there. This is life and death. It's very, very important. Where are you going to spend eternity? And eternity is a mighty long time. I can't imagine it. You know, you know it's, it's like I've been alive for so long now, it's not even funny. And it's only a few years. Before you know it, it you know, a thousand years, you're, you're out the strip Methuselah, and what is it, 936 years or something. You just keep going and going and going and going out into eternity. A thousand years, 10,000 years. 100,000 years, a million years, 10 million, 100 million, a billion, 
five billion, ten billion, twenty billion, a hundred billion, a trillion, quadrillion, quadrillion, zillion, trillion, billion, zillion, quadrillion, gazillion years. It never stops. And yet we want to live in sin for just a few years and screw up our eternity. Amen? May that not be anybody's portion in this place in Jesus' name. I know I know I have laid this out heavy, and I'm okay with it. You guys are a great church. I I know I can go preach this message in a lot of churches, and if they were like, he's gonna be preaching for the next six weeks, the parking lot would be empty for six weeks, and they'd be calling each other, is he gone yet, is he gone yet? And then as soon as I'm gone, they'd all come back to church again because they know it was safe. Amen. And I'm okay with it. I'm not trying to be popular. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I'm happy. I got a good life. I'm happy where I'm at. God is good. I'm going to make it. You're going to make it. We're going someplace. Amen. That'd be a good place for an amen. We're going someplace. You're going to make it. Hey, I got one. Give me five, Barry. Hey! <laughs> well, that's my message. Let's close. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I'm going to close the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this word. I know that it was heavy, Father. I know that it was solid. I know that it was right straight from your word. I know this is the message that Jesus preached. Get right with God while you have the opportunity. Don't play with it. Today is the day of salvation, Lord. Touch each and every heart in this place. Touch them, Father. Draw them nearer to you. Anything that we've done, anything we've said, anything we've thought, anything we've imagined that would keep us from your kingdom, Father, anything that would cause us to deviate from the narrow path, Father, we cancel that assignment of the enemy by fire in the name of Jesus. Lord, my prayer is that you will save both me and my hearers and I thank you for this word that was put out there, Father. May it land on fertile soil, and may it give its increase. In Jesus' name, amen.